Hey, welcome. We are back. We're going to be trying some e-learning. I'm going to try to be using this program called Loom, and I think it should work pretty darn well for you to see what the heck is going on here. Um, I had recorded this lesson. It took me 30 minutes and realized it wasn't recording properly. So hopefully we'll get this one right this time. So what we're going to talk about today is something called chemical stewardship. Now, uh, the graphic here obviously is of a, of a flask with an earth in it. And the earth is really just a big old experiment where there's solutions. There's the air that we breathe and the oceans and the water and our bodies. All are just chemical solutions. And what we put in there into the environment, into our body, it matters. So chemical stewardship is talking about being responsible and how we use uh, chemicals, how we dispose of chemicals, and so on. So my first slide here shows this cute little frog on the right side. He's very tiny. That's kind of cute. And then you look carefully and you're like, well, it looks as though he has an extra set of legs. Well, you are correct. It does have an extra set of legs. Now, why is that? Well, this little frog was found at Minnesota near the 3M manufacturing chemical plant in a lake beside there. Now, the average person might assume that the chemical company 3M is responsible for polluting the environment. And that's probably simply not correct. More likely, the culprit for this would be, you can see up here, my neighbor Bob. It's springtime, and Bob, like me and everyone else, is wants a nice green yard, so we put chemicals in our yard. And if we buy that bag of fertilizer, and maybe it's a little bit more fertilizer than we need, we don't want to store it, so we just go ahead and put maybe double the fertilizer that we should in our yard. Now, the problem with that is the ground, the grass can't use all that fertilizer. When we get heavy rains, that extra fertilizer goes into runoff and it gets into our water supply and causes other problems. A frog spends its whole life in the water or around the water as a tadpole and a frog. And so if it causes this problem to the frog, it makes me wonder what, it, what the water contamination is doing to me. So chemical stewardship deals with being responsible in how you dispose of and how you use chemicals. Oftentimes, chemical pollution can travel great distances far away from where you deposited them, and they can ha cause harm to organisms that you weren't expecting. Um, think, for example, if in Canada, the people there were dumping bad things into the water supply. Well, that water gets into the Great Lakes and works its way down into Illinois, where we live, and that gets in our water supply. So we are concerned about water pollution. You can imagine if someone would decide to put a, uh, I don't know, let's say a mega hog farm right next to you. Well, first of all, we have laws, so a, a mega hog farm could not be put next to you in, your, in a residential area. But what a mega hog farm is, is kind of what you think. It's a farm full of hogs, but instead of having maybe 20 hogs, it might have 500 hogs on, in your neighbor's backyard. Now, if you can imagine that, that would be loud, that would be stinky, and those animals would produce a lot of waste that could end up going into your yard if that land was a little bit higher up than your yard. And so we are concerned about where the pollution goes. Um, and it's generally not businesses. Businesses, if caught polluting the environment, that would be great harm to that business as shoppers would exclude and not use the services of that company. Um, they would just boycott it. So companies have to be pretty responsible in how they deal with chemicals. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, for me, the frog itself, I'm not concerned about, but what it represents does concern me. The frog is in contaminated water and it causes this mutation. Well, uh, years ago, coal miners would bring with them a canary into the mine. And the purpose was the canary would sing very fast. And if the canary, they didn't necessarily sing fast, they would breathe fast. And if the canary died due to cyanide gas, that was a sign for the miner to leave before he died. So much like the canary was an early warning sign of bad quality air, when we see frogs with mutations, that should be an early warning sign of the water quality is being contaminated and we need to pay attention and do something about that. In the 1980s, in uh, the Chesapeake Bay area, 
the scientists found an explosion of the Fisteria organism. It's a microscopic organism that lives in the water. Now, if you remember uh, from biology, something called the carrying capacity, when an organism has enough food, they will keep reproducing and reproducing and reproducing as long as they have food to live. So what happened is homeowners would dump fertilizer and other chemicals into the waterway and this would cause the Fisteria populations to grow exponentially. Now, the poor fish in the water were being literally eaten alive by this Fisteria. You can see the fish with the lesions all over their bodies. This would also happen to people that would happen to walk in the water, go swimming. They would find their legs would be very itchy. And so they very quickly figured out the problem was due to Fisteria. And the solution was to educate the people to have them stop polluting in the water, stop dumping chemicals in the water. And as soon as they did that, within a year or so, the levels of Fisteria returned back to the normal level. And they haven't been a problem since. Fisteria would be similar to, if you remember in biology, studying the red tide. These were the dinoflagellates that when their populations grew too much, the water would turn like a blood red color. And you can look into that if you're, if you're curious. Again, always and almost always due to uh, the wrong ratio of chemicals in the water. Now, next I want to talk a little bit about Rachel Carson. Uh, she was a scientist and uh, ended up becoming a brilliant writer, wrote several best-selling books about the environment. One was called Silent Spring. I included here a, uh, a PDF of her entire book. You can just uh, Google Silent Spring and you can read the book online if you wish. Um, she, she was very concerned about the overuse of pesticides. In World War II, a chemical called DDT was used uh, a great deal in the South Pacific and it, and it killed all the insects and it was a fantastic pesticide um, and it saved probably hundreds of thousands of lives of soldiers not dying from malaria and other insect-borne illnesses. After World War II though, um, society decided that we, that is man, could get rid of all pests if we just used the synthetic pesticide. Uh, the problem with that is Mother Nature is very resilient and whatever pests survived were even more difficult to kill. So we ended up making superbugs, um, much like antibiotic resistance because of antibiotic soap that used to only be used in hospitals is now used by every consumer. Um, the, the other things I want to mention about Rachel Carson is she helped us understand bioaccumulation of toxins in the environment. Um, if you remember in biology, you maybe would have studied birds of prey like eagles, and you found out that the eagles would lay eggs, and the eggs would be very thin, and when the birds would sit on them, the eggs would crack. Now, the reason for this was due to bioaccumulation of toxins in the environment. The birds, those big birds, would eat fish that lived in the rivers. And the fish in the rivers would eat smaller fish and insects, and those insects would eat other things. And they were all being exposed to different toxics, toxic things in the environment, such as DDT. Now, what happens is when a larger creature eats a smaller creature, it assumes and accumulates all of the toxins of the smaller animal into their body. And this is called bioaccumulation. Now, Rachel Carson was one of the first people to point out that just because a chemical didn't outright kill you did not mean it was safe to use. Now, this was not the mindset of people in the 1940s and 50s. They believed if a chemical didn't kill you, it must be safe to use. We no longer believe uh, this, this thought process. Um, some other little things about Rachel Carson. She ended up dying of uh, cancer, started off as breast cancer, and then went to many other parts of her body, and she did not want to let people know, especially the chemical industry, this fact. The chemical industry were, were uh, angry, might be too light a term, uh, of Rachel Carson. They were not happy with her insistence that these pesticides were not safe to be used as broadly as they were being used. She didn't think they needed to be banned completely, but they needed to be used more responsibly. So the chemical industry attacked her just terribly. 
They attacked her because she was a woman. They attacked her because she only had a master's degree. They never attacked the science that she did, uh, but they did not like the message that she, she gave. Um, and, and she did not want them to know because that she had cancer because they, she figured they would have used that as an attack against her. Like here's an angry woman who got cancer and is now just mad at the chemical industry. Um, there's a documentary. I put the video and the link to this on the calendar. It's about a 10 minute summary of a two hour video, but it's some, some really good stuff. If you want to learn more about Rachel Carson, um, the, 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 the bottom line here says things we can't see in the environment, such things as radiation or chemicals, or even if you're thinking about today, COVID-19, even though you can't see them, they can harm us. So we can't just be so cavalier to think that if these chemicals uh, being exposed to them aren't causing some problem to humans, much like the canary in the mine or the frog with the three legs. These are warning signs for us to be careful with how we use any of these chemicals. Uh, so I, I hope you take some time to watch those videos. Um, you, if you, you put in the context of when Rachel Carson's book came out in 19, I believe it's 64, uh, you have to remember John Kennedy dies, he's assassinated, uh, and then people are starting to be enlightened to the fact that the environment is gonna matter, that what's in the environment can actually harm us thinking about the radiation from World War II and the above ground atomic weapons experiments. Then we move on and we end up having uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Excuse me, I already mentioned that, but uh, Bobby Kennedy, his brother, the attorney general, uh, the assassination of MLK. Finally, we get to the moon in 1969. We look at the earth and we realize there's no place else for us that is humans to live. And so we finally have the recognition that we have to treat Earth kindly. We can't pollute it, that it's a precious resource that must be protected. And so in 1970, we start the Earth Day movement. So I left a small little couple minute video about the basics of Earth Day for you to watch as well. Um, as you as a consumer, you can go to the store, uh, you can go to Menards and you can buy lots of chemicals. They have hundreds of chemicals for you to buy there. And many are organic solvents. I've got just a few here. Uh, mineral spirits you might use to clean up oil-based paint. Uh, xylol is an organic solvent. Uh, turpentine, lacquer thinner. These would all be chemicals that would be used in an industrial sense to strip other materials away. The average consumer probably should not be using them if they're not trained properly. Um, acetone, you're familiar with, that would be nail polish remover. Uh, methyl ketone, I'm going to come back to it. I want to talk about some of the health problems with that and many of these chemicals that the average consumer simply is not aware of. Um, boil linseed oil is a, a neat little product. I do a lot of woodworking and boil linseed is an oil that's extracted from boiling the linseed. It's a type of seed. Now, it's a very oily substance. Um, it's used as a wood finish, a natural wood finish. If you make a nice handmade wooden project, you can put on some gloves. You can mix a little bit of linseed oil with mineral spirits, and you simply rub it on, soaking it in a cotton cloth and rubbing it on the wood back and forth. No worry about brush strokes. It dries overnight. You can lightly sand it with steel wool and do it again and again and again. And you can put five or six coats on there, and it'll be a very hard, very shiny, very water resistant, beautiful finish. And people pay a great deal of money to have a hand boiled linseed rubbed finish on wood. It's not safe for um, um, children product like a crib as children's might teeth on it. It's a little toxic. Um, and the second thing that a lot of people don't know is the rags that you use when that boiled linseed dries, it gets very, very hot. So if you throw those rags into a garbage can, they can spontaneously combust and literally burn down your house. So, so what you have to do is put them in a plastic, like a Ziploc bag, squeeze all the air out uh, so that when they dry, they don't have air to combust the cotton cloth. Well, there's some other little ones we'll mention, paint thinner and latex and kerosene. Uh, kerosene would also be jet fuel. That's what aircraft use. Um, 
and muriatic acid. Another name for that would be hydrochloric acid. That's what you find in your stomach. So all these are chemicals that, yes, you and me and anyone else can go into the hardware store and buy without knowing how to safely use them. Now, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about methyl ethyl ketone. So methyl ethyl ketone, here is, uh, well, this is close enough, methylene chloride's material safety data sheet. And what it says here are some potential chronic health effects. And it uses the word carcinogenic effects, classified and proven by OSHA. What that says is, if you use this stuff, it can cause cancer in humans. Reading on, it says toxicity. This substance is toxic to lungs, the nervous system, liver, mucous membranes, central nervous system. Well, that's telling you it's going to cause brain damage. Repeated or prolonged exposure to these substances can produce target organs damage. In other words, there's nothing you can do to use this stuff safely. It will cause problems for you. All you can do is mitigate, that's limit your exposure, and use protective gear. So even though this stuff is sold to the consumer, it has a warning sign on it, you are ultimately responsible in how you use it. If you choose to use these things, please read all the safety labels, use the personal protection devices that it mentions, wear gloves, wear a respirator, one of those good respirators meant for chemical fumes and safety glass, etc. If you do this, you'll be safer, um, but sometimes it's just not something the average consumer should be doing. Now, sometimes the exposure we get to chemicals is not by accident. And what I'm thinking about here is people that inject drugs or take pills that maybe they shouldn't be taking. Now, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on steroids at this point because it's springtime and people are thinking about getting that big body, going to the beaches after after this COVID-19 scare is over. And I, I put a little quote at the bottom that says, steroid use is like a credit card. It gives you the body now, but when it comes time to pay the bill, are you going to be man enough to pay the bill? I thought I was, but I wasn't. Bob Hazelton. Well, who is Bob Hazelton, you might ask? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of explanation about who he was. Bob Hazelton was a professional boxer. He would have been a professional boxer in the 1960s and 70s. He was six foot seven, 183 pounds. To put this in perspective, I'm six foot tall and weigh 180 pounds. So he's seven inches taller than me and weighs just three pounds more than me, seven pounds or whatever it is. And yet he's boxing for the heavyweight championship of the world or wants to. Um, I think you both know if I were boxing, I'd get crushed. Bob Hazelton didn't do particularly well in his early fight for the championship. So this, this made him think about trying to put on weight. And steroids were a new thing. So he was introduced to steroids in England, and he took them with pretty good results, what he felt. His body weight went from 183 to 220 pounds, and he moved up in the, in the rankings. Well, he was just one fight away from getting a chance for the heavyweight championship. And in this box, he, what he did like, he liked the feel the steroids gave him. It gave him kind of a, a, a rage feeling, a feeling of anger that he could win in the, in, and not feel pain when he got punched. Now, you and I might call this roid rage. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Right? Um, I've included some links on steroids, KO'd Bob Hazelton. Uh, this one was from the Chicago, I think the New York Times. There's another one from the Chicago Tribune, an article with some good links. I'll leave them on the, on the calendar if you want to read them. Um, there's another story here that I left you uh, on the wrestler, and I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Benoit. And he was a WWF wrestler in uh, the uh, probably the late 1990s, and maybe even the early 2000s. And on Christmas Day, he murdered his wife and his family, and then killed himself. Uh, when they did an autopsy, they realized that the amount of testosterone in his body was over 10 times what a normal male should be. This level of testosterone creates tremendous aggression that probably contributed greatly to his roid rage. The response from the wrestling industry was to test all of their performers, and they are performers, and they realized that all the main names were off the charts in unsafe levels of steroids. So for a period of time, they had a bunch of B and C string wrestlers on TV. Since then, they've tried to uh, uh, refrain 
from having these people have those bodies. Uh, I call them Barbie bodies. If you look at Barbie, Barbie's proportions are not something that God ever made for any woman. And the WWF wrestlers, those bodies are not simply from lifting weights. Those are chemical bodies from steroid use and human growth hormones. And probably there, there are not probably there are a great number of problems associated with doing that to your body. Well, let's get back to Bob Hazelton and his boxing match. So he's boxing, and he realizes that he's not feeling the back of his leg is going numb. And he looks down and he realizes his leg is swelling up like a balloon. Now the the doctor looks at it and says it's just the blood clot. You can continue to fight. Now I don't understand that. Uh, a, a blood clot that goes to your brain or lungs is a stroke that can kill you instantly. Um, there was a reporter for the Today Show, David Gregory. No, excuse me, it wasn't David Gregory. Uh, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, and he went in in the first Gulf War, and he rode in on the tanks and, for like 18 hours. And when they got to Kuwait, there was no resistance. They got off the tank, and he was... Uh, allowing people to use his phone to call home and basically he had what's called a DVT or deep vein thrombosis a blood clot because he hadn't moved for 18 hours had formed in his somewhere in his body and it went to his brain now they had all the medics there they were unfortunately not able to save him and he died right there on the spot this is sometimes what happens to um, people that fly especially elderly people that fly uh, long flights from England or India if you have to sit in a, an airplane for a long period of time and not move around, then you finally get to your destination and you're walking around playing with the children, the grandchildren. All of a sudden, those clots break loose and, and you can have, again, a medical condition called a DVT or deep vein thrombosis that can kill you. And that's why exercise every day is a little important. You do a little bit of exercise, you get those little micro blood clots moving around. So 20 minutes of exercise a day is really good for you. If you do the opposite, you're maybe a weekend warrior, which means you do no exercise all week, and then you go really hardcore on the weekend, that can actually be a bad deal for you because your blood can clot, and then when you start to really exercise, get your blood pressure up, those clots can move around your body and cause some problems. Um, well, Bob's blood clot did cause a problem. Um, he couldn't feel his leg, got knocked out. He thought his career was over as a, a professional boxer, and it, it basically was. So then what he did is he turned to human growth hormones and his weight shot up from 220 pounds to 320 pounds. At this point, he was a you know, six foot seven, 320 pound bodyguard. And he worked for like heavy metal bands like Def Leppard. If he tells you to get out of the way or sit down or shut up, you probably are gonna listen to Bob. Well, what happened next was terrible. The backs of Bob's legs were growing at such a rapid rate the blood supply couldn't keep up, and the muscles grew so fast the legs tore open. Both his legs had to be amputated above the knees. So now here this giant six foot seven man is now has no legs, can't walk. So he changes his life's mission. He becomes a social crusader against sports enhancing substances. He goes around to high schools around the country for 10 years talking about how steroids ruined his life now i'm going to read that quote to you again at the bottom of the page steroid use is like a credit card it gives you the body now but when it comes time to pay the bill are you going to be man enough to pay the bill i thought i was but i wasn't that makes a lot more sense now now if, if your chemistry teacher your health teacher is telling you about steroid use you're not probably listening if if you're seeing bob hazelton and you see his physical condition before and what he looks like now that story means a lot more now. I've also included on the calendar links where Bob Hazelton is talking to Congress. Um, this is a, a, a cartoon about Bobby Bonds. It says, you jackals in the media, you tear me down, rip me up, can't wait to see me fall. It's all your fault. And of course, Barry Bonds has lost a leg. He's a giant and you can see the needle from the steroid use. Well, most people, if you say Barry Bonds and they're a baseball fan, Put a little asterisk next to his name. He might have the home run record, but most people considered it stolen or that he cheated to receive that because he didn't do it naturally. He used chemicals to take an advantage. Um, 
you think about the Olympics, most or many of the Russian teams are banned from the Olympics because of the steroid use and the other chemical enhancements that they add to their body. We would call this cheating and it's not allowed in sports. Congress needs to act because professional athletes get paid millions of dollars. If they want to destroy their bodies, that's their life. The problem is college athletes want to get to the professional level and might do some desperate things like use some of these chemicals in their body to get an advantage. And high school kids want to get there to go play at the next level in college. You can imagine a six foot two high school basketball player that's pretty talented, but it's never gonna play D1 because he's not quite big enough. So he decides to do some human growth hormones in hopes that his weight will shoot up to six, seven, and that maybe his weight will go from 200 to 250. Well, that might work out, but it might not work out. So you gotta be very, very, very careful. I would say if you're considering any of these things, from creatine to uh, uh, any substance you put in your body. Talk to your doctor, not your coach. Your coach isn't a medical doctor. Your coach doesn't know what's really happening. When you go in to get your physical, talk to your doctor. Do some research online first, but talk to your doctor about what are the true risks of steroid use. Um, I've included here a little graphic, some potential negative side effects. I'll just read a few of them. Um, headaches, baldness, strokes and blood clots, which you've already mentioned, the blood clots, high blood pressure, heart disease, nausea, bloating, impotence. Um, besides impotence, your, your uh, pardon my French, but your big bazooka becomes a little squirt gun that doesn't even squirt anymore, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, you have aggressive behavior mentioned with the roid rage incidents, um, increased risk of tendon injuries, enlarged prostate, which is not going to help you development of breasts in males, uh, reduction of breasts in females, severe acne on face and back, gapping in teeth, cream, your skull grows, uh, just a, a host of terrible things happen to your body. So I hope you, you don't consider any of those things, okay? Now, when doing a little background research, I found an article or a comment left by somebody uh, related to Bob Hazen. I, I felt it was interesting. It says, um, Hazleton went from 183 to 220 pounds. He stopped Danabol, that's the steroid, anabolic steroid, in 1977. Supposedly enlightened, he then used HGH, that's human growth hormone, until 1986 and weighed 320 pounds. Undoubtedly much of it fat. And who knows what his diet was. Get real. Documented steroid deaths averaged three a year. And those guys are using way too much and eating way too much. Compare that to tobacco. Now, he makes an interesting point that the actual number of fatalities may not be very high from steroid use, but I would bring you back to the idea of Rachel Carson and the fact that the chemical industry in the 1950s said, if a chemical doesn't kill you, it's safe to use. And we know that's simply not true. Even though it doesn't kill you right away, it might set you at risk and to causing different cancers and other health problems in your life. So... I think the, uh, the, the, the person who left that comment was well-intended, but maybe ignorant of the fact of the real dangers of steroid use. The bottom line, our bodies are complex chemical solutions. What goes in our bodies matter. Um, what we expose our bodies to matter. Many people uh, worry about the, the drinking water that they have. They, they buy filters to filter their water. They buy organic foods because they're concerned about chemical exposure. Um, I think all of these are probably things that individually we must consider um, how that affects us. Um, finally, I left a, um, an article and I, I put a video on your calendar. It's about a man that ingests colloidal silver, small particles of silver, and it literally turns him to a permanent blue color. And I'll let you watch the video. He was on Oprah's show with Dr. Oz, if you find that interesting. Um, that is what we wanted to cover in terms of for our lesson for today. Um, I can go real quickly to the calendar. Let me see if I can find where that was here. Uh, I think we're about here on the calendar. Let me click on it. Give me just a second. I've got too many tabs open, as you can see. Uh, let's try this guy here. Let's try here. And, and the calendar. Okay. So let's view that calendar here. So 
here we are, March 31st, chemical stewardship. So if we click on that, um, it's going to come up with, here's the video I'm recording right now. You can see that one, watch it again. You can change the speed and do all that, expand it to make it full screen. Other things on here, I included the lesson plan um, for the notes. There's a PDF. These are already all filled in for you. If you don't want them filled in, click the second set and some lesson plans. I might deviate some from this, um, but these are the general ideas of what are important in this unit. Uh, there's two PowerPoint presentations. There's one for regular chemistry, general chem, uh, a little bit fewer slides, and that's what the notes will correspond with. And then there's the ones for honors chemistry that have a little bit more information. I will utilize and make videos of all these for you. So if you're watching the videos, you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, the chemical stewardship slides, the ones I went through, I added some new ones that aren't here, but you get the general idea. You can watch the video again if needed. Uh, I've included here the video for you to watch. Um, this one's only about 10 or 11 minutes, but very interesting. Gives you some good background about Rachel Carson. I put a little short two or three minute video on Earth Day. Always good to uh, appreciate and think about the Earth and all that it does for us. Finally, I left some videos. If you want to actually watch George Foreman versus Bob Hazelton box in 1969, I've got a little video of that. You can watch uh, Bob Hazelton lose that match. You can hear him speak um, in front of Congress, talking about imploring Congress to take actions against professional athletes and steroid use, which is where really all the testing of professional athletes came from. We can thank Bob Hazelton for his contribution. I believe Bob Hazelton died in 2014. Um, um, I don't know if he died. He was like 62 years old or 67. I'm not sure if that was prematurely due to some of the steroid use. I suspect it might have had something to do with that. And finally, there's an ABC story on Bob Hazelton, kind of in his prime, after he had lost his legs, but still in pretty good shape. Um, lastly, I left at the bottom of the page uh, an article on Bob um, Hazelton steroids. The last PDF would be a good one to read, it's just two pages. No homework for you today. Um, normally, you will have homework. But again, you've got some of videos to watch, kind of just plant that seed of being responsible in chemicals, being aware of chemicals that we're exposed to, either intentionally because we put them in our body, in our yard, in our environment, or unintentionally because they're there from above ground nuclear weapons testing or someone's burning a, a tire in, in, in a neighborhood and you have to ingest the fumes coming from that. All of these things matter. Um, I hope you're healthy. I hope you're able to keep up. And I look forward to your emails and thoughts that you have about how I can improve our e-learning experience. Take care. Have a good day.